Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Engineer's Thumb Part 2 I looked at the books on the table, and although I do not understand German, I could see that two of them were on scientific subjects, the others were books of poetry. Then I walked across to the window, hoping to see a little of the surroundings of the house, but strong, heavy boards were nailed across the window on the outside. It was an unusually silent house. The only sound came from an old clock somewhere in the passage. I felt myself becoming more and more anxious. Who were these German people, and what were they doing, living in this strange, out-of-the-way place? And where was the place? I only knew that it was ten or twelve miles from Eiford, but I had no idea whether it was north, south, east, or west. Of course, Reading and possibly other large towns were about the same distance away but the complete stillness made it clear that Captain Stark's house was right out in the country. I walked anxiously up and down the room, singing to myself under my breath to give myself courage and feeling that I was thoroughly earning my fifty pounds. Then, without a sound, the door of the room swung slowly open and I saw the woman standing there. Behind her was the darkness of the hall and the yellow light from my lamp shone on her eager and beautiful face. It was easy to see that she was in a state of extreme fear, and as a result, my own blood turned to ice. She held up one shaking finger to warn me to be silent. Her eyes, as she looked back into the dark passage, were like those of a frightened horse. You must go away, she whispered in broken English, with an effort to speak calmly. There is no good here for you to do. But I have not yet done what I came to do. I cannot possibly leave until I have seen the machine. You will gain nothing by staying, she went on. You can pass through the door. Nobody prevents you. And then, seeing that I only smiled and shook my head, she suddenly gave up her attempt to speak calmly and took a step forward. For the love of heaven, she said, stretching out her hands towards me. Get away from here before it is too late. But it is not easy to make me change my mind, and difficulties only make me more determined. I thought of my fifty pounds, of the tiring journey I had just made, and of the unpleasant night that was just beginning. Must all this be completely wasted? Why should I run away without carrying out my orders, and without receiving my pay for the night's work? Maybe this woman was crazy, though her warning had worried me. I still shook my head firmly and said I would stay. She would have gone on trying to persuade me, but just then we heard the noisy closing of a door upstairs and the sound of footsteps on the stairs. She listened for a moment, threw up her hands in hopelessness, and then disappeared as suddenly and silently as she had come. When Captain Stark came back into the room, there was another man with him. This second man was short and fat, with a beard like a goat's growing out of the folds of his round face. The captain introduced him to me as Mr. Ferguson. 
Mr. Ferguson is my secretary and manager, said the captain. Then he gave me a strange look and said, Mr. Hatherley, I had the idea that I left this door shut just now. Yes, I replied, but the room seemed a little airless, and so I opened the door to let some air in. Well, perhaps we had better begin our business now. Mr. Ferguson and I will take you up to see the machine. I had better put my hat on, I suppose, I said. Oh no, it is in the house. What? Do you dig Fuller's earth in the house? No, no, this is only where we press it into bricks. But never mind that. All we wish you to do is to examine the machine and to let us know what is wrong with it. We went upstairs together, the captain first with the lamp, the fat manager and myself behind him. It was the kind of old house in which it would be easy to get lost, full of passages, narrow stairways, and little low doors. There were no floor coverings, and above the ground floor there seemed to be no furniture at all. I tried to appear calm and cheerful, but I had not forgotten the warnings of the lady, and I watched my two companions anxiously. Ferguson appeared to be a bad-tempered and silent man, but I could tell from his voice that he was at least an Englishman. At last, Captain Stark stopped outside a low door, which he unlocked. The room inside was small and square, so small in fact, that the three of us could hardly have gone inside at the same time. Ferguson remained outside, and I went in with the captain. We are now, he said, actually inside the press, and it would be extremely unpleasant for us if anyone turned it on. The seeding of this little room is really the moving part of the press and it comes down with very great force on this metal floor. The machine still works, but it seems to be sticking, and it has lost some of its power. I should like you to examine it, please, and to show us how we can put it right. I took the lamp from him and examined the machine very thoroughly. It was certainly a very large and powerful one. When I went back outside and pressed down the handles that controlled it, I could tell from the soft whistling sound that there was a slight escape of water from one part into another. This was the explanation for the loss of pressure. A further examination showed that one of the rubber seals in the press had become worn and thin, and this was how the water was escaping. I pointed this out to my companions, who listened very carefully to what I said and asked several questions about what they should do to put the problem right. When I had made it clear to them, I went back inside the machine and had another good look at it, to satisfy my own desire to find out what it was. I realized that the story of the Fooler's Earth was a complete he. It was impossible to believe that such a powerful machine could be intended for such a purpose. The walls were made of wood, but the floor was like a kind of iron bath. When I examined this more closely, I saw that it was coated with another sort of metal in a fine powder. I had bent down and was fiefing this to find out exactly what it was when I heard a few angry words in German and saw the captain looking down at me. What are you doing in there? he asked. I was feeling angry with him for telling me lies. I was admiring your fuller's earth, I said. I think you ought to have told me the real purpose of your machine before asking me to advise you about it. As soon as I had spoken, I wished I had not. A cold, hard expression came into Captain Stark's face, and I saw that his grey eyes were full of hatred. Very well, he said. I will show you everything about the machine. He took a step backwards, shut the little door and quickly turned the key. I rushed towards it and pulled at the handle. Then I pushed and kicked at the door, but it held firm. Captain Stark! Captain Stark! I shouted. Let me out! And then suddenly in the silence I heard a sound that sent my heart to my mouth with fear. It was the controlling handles being pressed down and the slight whistling noise of the water. Captain Stark had turned on the machine. The lamp was still on the iron floor of the press, and by its fight, I saw that the black ceiling was coming down on me, slowly and unsteadily, but with enough power to crush me into the floor. A 
with a terrible cry I threw myself against the door and tore with my nails at the lock. I begged the captain to let me out, but the sounds of the machinery drowned my cries. The ceiling was now only a foot or two above my head, and by raising my arm, I could feel its hard, rough surface. Then the thought struck me that the pain of my death would depend very much on the position of my body at the last moment. If I lay on my face, the weight would come on my backbone, and I trembled to think of the terrible sound of my own back breaking. Perhaps it would be easier the other way, but had I enough courage to hee and look up at that fearful black shadow as it came nearer and nearer, already I was unable to stand up when I noticed something that brought hope back to my heart. I have said that though the floor and the seating were made of iron, the walls of the press were wooden. As I gave a last, hopeless look around, I saw a thin line of yellow light between two of the boards, and this line became wider and wider as a small door was pushed backwards. For a moment, I could hardly believe that here was a door that led away from death. The next moment, I threw myself through and lay half fainting on the other side. The door had closed again behind me, but the crash of the lamp as the seating struck it, and a few moments afterwards, the sound of the top and bottom of the press meeting made me realize what a narrow escape I had had. Suddenly, as I lay outside the press, I felt somebody pulling at my wrist, and I saw that I was on the stone floor of a narrow passage, and a woman with an oil lamp in her hand was bending over me. It was the same good friend whose earlier warning I had so stupidly faded to take seriously. Come, come, she cried. They will be here in a moment. They will see that you are not there. Oh, do not waste valuable time, but come with me. This time, at least, I took her advice. Unsteady, I stood up and ran with her along the passage and down a narrow staircase, which led to another broad passage. Just as we reached this second passage, we heard the sound of running feet and the shouting of two voices, one answering the other, from the floor where we were and from the one below. My guide stopped and looked around her as if she did not know what to do. Then she threw open a door which led into a bedroom, through the window of which the moon was shining brightly. It is your only chance, she said. The window is high up but perhaps you can jump out. As she spoke, a light appeared at the other end of the passage, and I saw the thin figure of Captain Stark rushing forward with a lamp in one hand and an axe in the other. I rushed across the bedroom, threw open the window, and looked out. How quiet and pleasant the garden looked in the moonlight. It was about thirty feet down. I climbed out, but did not jump immediately as I wanted to hear what was about to happen between Stark and the lady who had saved me from death. If it were necessary, I was determined, whatever the risk, to return and help her. This thought had hardly flashed through my mind before he was at the door, pushing his way past her, but she threw her arms around him and tried to hold him back. Fritz, Fritz, remember your promise after the last time she cried in English. You said it would never happen again. He will not tell anyone. Oh, I am sure he will not. You are crazy, Elise, he shouted, struggling to free himself. You will be the ruin of us. He has seen too much. Let me pass, I say. He pushed her to one side, rushed to the window, and struck at me with his axe. At that moment, I was hanging by my hands to the bottom of the window. I was conscious of a dull pain, and I fell into the garden below. I was not hurt too much by the fall, so I got to my feet and rushed off among the bushes as fast as I could run. I knew that I was not out of danger yet. Suddenly, as I ran, I began to feel sick and faint. I looked down at my hand, which by now was really painful, and saw the first time that my thumb had been cut off and that blood was pouring from the wound. I attempted to tie a piece of cloth round it, but suddenly I seemed to hear a strange singing noise in my ears, and the next moment I fainted and fell. 